Christ is risen. I can almost hear you. He's risen indeed. What a glorious truth. Whatever else we're going through, the strangeness of the moment, to know that Christ is risen changes everything. You know, our reaction on this strange Easter Sunday morning is really not so strange if you think about it. I want to read to you from the first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 16. There it says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. That's such a strange, really unanticipated reaction to us, isn't it? We, after all, we've gotten up early on this Lord's Day morning because we want to celebrate the resurrection. We're joyful and happy. We've been posting on Facebook and tweeting. We're joining each other, sending each other messages right now. Christ is risen. He's alive. We're celebrating. But notice that the reaction that Mary and Salome and the, the, the mother of James had was that they were terrified. Now, when you think about it, that's probably what we would feel. Even perhaps we may feel on this Lord's day right now, because we know that Jesus is alive and yet there are things happening in our world right now that might make us full of fear. I think there are some reasons to, to fear Easter. As these women are approaching the tomb, their biggest concern at first is who's going to roll away the stone. The text tells us it's a very large stone. They don't know how they're going to get in there. When they arrive, the first thing they notice is someone has already moved the stone. And that big surprise is really the least surprising thing that happens from that moment on. Because when they look into the tomb where they've gone with great tenderness to anoint the body of Jesus, because they couldn't do it properly on that Friday afternoon because the Sabbath was coming on but they discover that his body's not there. Now, this was certainly confusing because bodies don't just disappear. People don't get up from the dead. And when they see this angel, the angel tells them very plainly, look, he's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. He's gone. Now go tell his disciples and they don't immediately go and tell the disciples. It says they, they flee in terror. In fact, in the Greek language, the word there is one of those words that's used only one time in all of the New Testament. And it means that they were terrified. I think fearing Easter, fearing the resurrection is actually a very reasonable response because if Jesus really rose from the dead, First of all, life is far more unpredictable than we might ever have thought. We spend a great deal of our time trying to control things, don't we? We want to control our health at the moment. 
we've gone to great lengths to make sure that we don't make anyone else sick and we don't get sick. We're trying to keep our hospital systems from being pushed to the max and overflowing. We don't have enough respirators. We, we feel the lack of control and it, it terrifies us to think that someone we love might die because they don't have a respirator because our healthcare system is just pushed beyond its limits. We want to control things. And anytime we feel like we don't have control, we're a little afraid of that. Well, I have news for you. If Jesus got up out of that grave, you don't really have control over anything because things aren't what they seemed. Life is simply unpredictable. We like to think that it's just a simple equation of physics, that one thing causes another, that the physical universe operates under certain laws. And indeed, most of the time it does. Most of the time gravity works. Most of the time you know, one body can't pass through another. But when Jesus rose from the dead, it's like we know now that box is open. This universe is not a closed system. It's not all just happening based on the laws of physics that there's a God who's in control and he's involved not just in the processes, not just in making the laws of physics. Sometimes he violates them. Sometimes he does things so unexpected and unpredictable that it would be foolish for us to put our trust in merely the laws of physics and the way this physical universe works. We have to put our trust in him because life is far more unpredictable than we ever thought. It, we aren't in control. But the risen Lord, the one who can defeat death and get up out of that tomb, he's in control. I think a second reason that we might fear Easter is it means that mortal life is relative in its importance. It's diminished in its significance. You know, if, if this life is all there is, then there's a certain way you would live it. You'd live it to get as much pleasure as you possibly can because this is your only shot and there's nothing after this. So get all you can get and keep it and use it for your pleasure and don't worry about anybody else because if this life is all we are ever going to have, then we're mainly consumers. But if Jesus got up out of the grave, that means there's something more than this life. There's something beyond this life. There's an eternal life. There's a place in eternity. And what we do in this life is very, very important but it's a drop in the vast ocean of eternity. It really doesn't compare to the significance of the life beyond that empty tomb. Well, that changes the way we think. That means that the things that maybe we have put our stock and our trust in is diminished in significance. It can't really help us, let alone save us. That upends all of our thinking that makes us fearful. And there's a third thing. And that is that if God raised Jesus from the dead, that indicates that God resoundingly and definitively said yes to Jesus and the way of life that he revealed. Jesus revealed the way God wants us to live. And quite frankly, we don't live like him. We don't care about the will of God the way he did. We don't care about others the way he did. We are far more self-centered, self-oriented than Jesus was. And if God raised him from the dead, if God said, I will not allow my Holy One to see corruption, then God vindicated Jesus and everything he stands for and everything he taught. And my life is in stark contrast to the life and the teaching of Jesus. No wonder these women ran in fear and terror from the grave because 
they no longer know what they thought they knew. They can no longer put their confidence in the things that they thought. They had thought Jesus was a great teacher. Mary called her called him her rabbi, Rabboni. But he's far more than that if God raised him from the dead. He's redeemer. How do we live with the, the fear that the resurrection strikes into our souls? Well, the first thing is we can give up our pathetic attempts at trying to be God and to control life. Once you get over the fear that comes from realizing you're not in control, it takes you to the point of desperation. What will I do then? And that's when you put your trust in God because he's in control. Because if he raised up Jesus from the dead, he did that with a purpose to show us the way to show us what pleases him and to give us eternal life. The good news is I don't have to be in control because I can rest in the one who is. That's what salvation is. It's coming to the end of ourselves, facing the fear of the resurrection and saying, oh no, this means that everything about me is wrong. God vindicated Jesus. I'm not in control. What do I do when you get to that point and you realize that I can't save myself. I can't live this life. I have to put my trust in him alone. You, you can give up all of your efforts at justifying self, at being self-righteous, and you can rest in the finished work of Christ. He said it on the cross, didn't he? It is finished. And when he got up out of that tomb, he demonstrated it. He gave us irrevocable proof that he really did finish the work. And we don't have to spend our lives trying to gain control or achieve our own righteousness. We can put our trust and our confidence in him, that he was righteous for us, that he faced death for us, that he rose from the dead for us. Also, it means that the suffering that we experience in this life is relativized too. If this mortal life and its importance is diminished, then so is our suffering. It's something we know a little bit about right now. We're all suffering to some extent. You know, suffering is anything you have that you don't want, anything you want that you don't have. It's really just a matter of degrees. All of us are suffering to some degree now because none of us want to be bound in our homes and unable to meet together and hug our grandchildren. This is miserable, isn't it? But there are some suffering far worse. Uh, the daughter of a dear friend of mine is on a ventilator right now with the coronavirus. And others are suffering in many other different ways, even unrelated to this, but now compounded by this. But if Jesus rose from the dead, that means this life is not all there is. And Paul put it like this, that the present sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. You see, if this mortal life's importance is diminished, so is our suffering. It means it's but for a moment. Jesus suffered more on the cross by God turning his back on him. He suffered more there than we can ever possibly imagine. It was not merely the physical suffering of the nails and being unable to breathe, it was that he became repugnant in the eyes of God because all of our sin was laid on him. And God looked at his own son with a hatred, a divine justice, because it was his wrath at our sin. And Jesus suffered that wrath, why? To diminish our suffering in this life so that what awaits us is not suffering in eternity in hell, but glory, eternity with Jesus. What an incredible joy. What an answer to our fear. But finally, this means we must follow Jesus wherever it leads. You know, the angel told Mary and the women, go to Galilee tell my disciples, but you know what? They disobeyed. 
they didn't immediately obey. They fled in fear. Fear caused them momentarily at least to disobey the instruction. It changed later, but that initial reaction was, oh, we're afraid. Let's, <laughs> well, let's run away. And you know, that's, that might be what we want to do when we see the implications of Jesus dying on the cross, rising from the dead. Now he beckons us, oh my, what does this mean? Go to Galilee. What's in Galilee? If, if they crucified Jesus and we follow him, they might crucify us too. That's correct. God gives us no promises about anything in this life. We very well will suffer. We might face death itself. They crucified our master. Jesus said, as the master must the servants be. We've got every reason to fear, but we have every reason to hope because God will always give us the grace that on the other side of that cross, there's an empty tomb. God will vindicate his people. God will raise us up. We don't have to fear death because we don't have to fear the empty tomb. Well, that might be our initial reaction. What does this mean for us? How do we live? But just like you've seen the sunrise slowly behind me, the light has begun to dawn while I've been speaking. So it is that as we think about the implications of the resurrection, it begins to dawn on us that the empty tomb means we have hope. Praise God for the hope that is ours. Today's a very special day. We might observe it differently than we typically do, but I want you to celebrate the truth, the reality that Jesus is alive. Now, today here at Buck Run, we're going to have Drive-By Annie. You know, this is our Annie Armstrong offering for North American missions. Look, times are tough. I know that. You may not be able to give what you normally give, but we don't want to leave our missionaries out there unsupported, uncared for, unprayed for. So we're asking you today to give a special offering. Now, the easiest and safest way to do that is online. I know that. But, you know, we wanted to give you the opportunity to just have, if nothing else, the sensation of coming to church, coming to this place on Easter Sunday. So today, if you'd like, get in your car, really anytime other than during our service. Uh, the pastors and I are going to be here to wave at you. You can crack your window a little bit, speak to us. We're going to maintain all the requ the requests that have been put on us to social uh, for social distancing. Tanya's going to be here with me. You know, it would do my heart good just to see you, to lay eyeballs on you and to say, I love you. This has been so hard, us not seeing each other. So if you have time and you want, you can bring your Annie Armstrong offering here. There's a place for you to drop it safely. We're not going to touch one another or, you know, as hard as it is to not embrace and hug each other on Easter Sunday. We're not going to do that, but we would love to see you. And you can give online, you can mail it in, but you can bring it here today. Even if you've already given online, you just want to drive here and wave at us and, and, and say, hi, we love you. And Christ is risen to one another. We can do that. Remember our live service is on uh, Facebook Live at 1045. You can also watch on your app or uh, at buckron.org, uh, live there. We have a special opportunity I want you to pray for. Now, I think if you're going to watch one of the two things, you can watch our live service at 1045. But we have a pre-recorded Easter service that's going to be broadcast on CWKYT, uh, and it's going out all over central Kentucky at 11 o'clock. Would you just pray that the Lord will use that? We give a clear presentation of the gospel. We're going to put up our phone number, have our ministers here uh, on the phones to receive calls that someone might have, uh, to ask about how to be saved or to profess faith in Christ. So would you just pray that the Lord will use this incredible opportunity that was uh, given to us and uh, that he, for his glory, might do for some soul, dead in trespasses and sins, what he did for the Lord Jesus and quicken them, give them life through the preaching of the gospel. It's going to be a marvelous day. Know that I love you, miss you terribly, and I thank God for you. Uh, what unites us is the truth of the resurrection. Christ is risen. 
He's risen indeed.